Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming to the Salt Marsh for this presentation, uh, the last for me this year. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who know, don't know me, I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work there at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us. So the other 59 do other stuff. So all I get to do is just do this, which is really, really great for me. Um, as you know, from the times I've been out here, um, I do a, a kind of a seminars on a variety of issues. Sometimes I'm talking to just introduce you to some of the, the players that you need to know as a senior. Um, and sometimes I'm talking about broader topics, you know, like generally wills, what do you need? This one is a really specific topic. This is kind of my favorite seminar, but I'll tell you to start, this is pretty dense and it's got math in it. Oh, it's got math in it. Now, so if you're following along and at some point you go, uh-oh, I just missed that math. Um, first of all, I'm glad to talk to you about this afterwards or just call me, I never charge for advice. And secondly, the point of this is not necessarily to get all the math, but to get the concept that if you do, it, you have to do the math to find out whether if you're in a nursing home or if you know somebody who's in a nursing home, you want to qualify for mass health because you can always qualify for mass health. It's not a question of whether you can qualify. The question is, what do you want to qualify? Uh, and in most cases you do, but this is, I'm going to talk to you about how you do the math to figure it out. So, you know my friends Frank and Mary, if you've been here before, those are my make-believe couple and, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people, if you get that joke, you're old enough to be in one of my seminars. Um, and their goals, as we've said before, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Um, those are their assets. And by the way, when they, the two of them have died, they just want to divide things Ideally, they would leave everything one spouse to the other, and then when the two of them have died, they want to divide things among their kids, right? And that's what they own. Uh, they own an extremely small house in Nantucket because it's only worth $300,000. Um, he has an IRA of 150. They have an annuity of 100. They've got bank accounts of 75. They've got total assets of $625,000. They're living totally on Social Security. He's got $2,000 a month, and she gets half of his, or $1,000 a month. So they're not living high off the hog. On the other hand, they have no mortgage. As long as their medical issues are okay, they're gonna be okay. They're both 80, and that's important as we go along. Remember, they are both 80 years old. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that these people worry about a lot, though, is, oh my God, what if one of us has to go into a nursing home, right? Because if you're 80, I think, no, I think the cutoff is, if you're 85, the chances are one in three that you have Alzheimer's at this point. Um, um, so, they, that, and that's what people worry about, right? I always tell people, most of my clients either have Alzheimer's or they're somebody they know has Alzheimer's or they're worried about it, and that's why they're talking to me. So, and they've heard, these people have typically heard that, oh my God, you know, in order to protect things in case one of us needs nursing home care, we really need to transfer everything out of our name and then we have to wait five years. Well, if you've come to my presentations before, you know that's not true, right? that if Mary, in this case, needed nursing home care, um, that for her to qualify for Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, and by the way, she's gonna need to qualify for Mass Health because Medicare is not gonna cover this home, nursing home care unless, if, unless she's there for less than 100 days, and even during those 100 days, unless she's getting better. But if she wants to qualify for Mass Health, she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets because Mass Health or Medicaid is health insurance for the poor. However, because Frank is alive, Frank can own the house, can own the house as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. And I know you're all saying to myself, yourselves, oh, I'm on Martha's Vineyard, it's worth more than that. And, but the way that Frank would deal with that in that case is he would simply go get a reverse mortgage and pull out enough money to get his equity below $828,000. He can have cash or cash equivalents, but only up to $119,200, so the annuity and the cash and all that stuff. But he can have unlimited income, unlimited income. So if Mary wanted to qualify for Mass Health, she'd simply shift all of her assets to Frank. Frank would then go out and buy himself an annuity. Uh, as long as the annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that does not exceed Frank's actuarial life expectancy, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. Frank, at age 80, has a life expectancy of about eight years. Um, so as long as the annuity called for monthly payments during a term that was shorter than that. By the way, even if Frank was really sick, doesn't make any difference if anybody really thinks he's gonna live for eight years. The point is there's a table, and it's being the government, everybody follows the table. So he's got eight years. So 
if Frank were, 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 if Mary needed nursing home care in this situation, Frank wouldn't have to worry. Um, the only thing he would do at that point, and I'd recommend him to do that actually even before this point, um, would be he'd want to make sure that his will did not say that upon his death everything went to Mary. Because of course if it did and he died owning anything, everything would go to Mary. She'd be way over $2,000 in countable assets. She'd have to spend down all of her cash. At that point she'd qualify for Mass Health because she can have her house and still qualify. But Mass Health would put a lien on the house to get repaid after her death. So she would, that's probably what he would want to do. But the point is, if Frank and Mary are both alive and one of them needs nursing home care, there's not an issue because you can do all these transfers the day before Mary qualifies. There's no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. If um, Frank were to die, though, uh, before they had done any of that, uh, and Mary ended up with those same assets, right, $300,000 house and $325,000 in other assets. Um, and her income jumped to $2,000 a month because now she's getting Frank's social security check. And she then needed nursing home care. She'd be like, oh, well now this is a problem, right? This is a problem, right? And this is the situation where you've always heard what you really need to do in that situation. If Frank had died and Mary wanted to protect her assets, was well, she needed to transfer them out of her name and wait five years. Not necessarily to an irrevocable trust, that's all what the lawyers want to sell you. You can just transfer it to your kids and wait five years, but the point is that would be a problem. So the question if what is, what if she didn't do that? What if she didn't do that? A not uncommon situation, right? Um, is, is, is it true that at this point, now that she's in the nursing home, she has to spend down all of that cash and sell the house and stuff before she can qualify for mass health? And the answer to that is no, she can qualify but why should she? Why should she want to qualify for Mass Health? Because if she qualifies for Mass Health, Mass Health is going to have a lien on whatever her assets are to get repaid after her death. And the reason for that is this, right? The typical, and I'm going to use as the, as the average private pay monthly cost of nursing home care, $12,000 a month. It is my understanding from the last people I talked to about an hour ago that they just read an article in the Nantucket paper that said, that the figure on, in, at, the, at the island home is now more than $500 a day, which would mean more than $15,000 a month. Correct. But I'm gonna use this as the number, because once again, whatever your situation is, you gotta do the math. Um, if that were the private, because that's a pretty typical on-island private pay number now, is $12,000. If, if, but if Mary qualifies for Mass Health <clears throat> in that very same nursing home, like our island home, um, in that very same bed, Mass Health has negotiated a different rate with that nursing home and with every nursing home. They have separate rates for every nursing home, just like private pay is separate for every nursing home. That, and, that, and that rate is going to vary depending on how much care Mary needs, right? Mass Health divides care into 10 categories, and the more nurse minutes per day you need, that's actually their measure, the more nurse minutes per day you need, the more they'll pay the nursing home. But that said, Typically, they're going to pay about $7,000. They're going to pay probably somewhere between $6,500 and $7,500. And it's totally unrelated to what the private pay cost is, by the way. I've seen nursing homes where literally the private pay cost was $3,000 per month more. But the mass health rate was like $5 a day or per month more. You know, they've no connect, or, or there was less, you know. So anyway, by being on mass health, Mary can cause. Um, there to be a drop of $5,000 per month in the amount that, she ha that has to be paid to the nursing home and therefore in her burn rate. And I'm going to use this term burn rate a lot. The burn rate is the rate at which Mary has to deplete her savings if she's in the nursing home. Right? And if she's on private pay at $12,000 a month um, and she's got income of $2,000 a month, which we went through, that means her burn rate is $10,000 per month. Uh, and if Mary's got assets of $325,000 and she's on private pay, she's going to burn through all that cash in 32.5 months. Or if she sells her house and takes and uses the proceeds together with her other cash, all $625,000, she's going to burn through all that in 62.5 months or five years, right? It's going to go pretty quick. So the question is whether we can cause Mary to be paying the nursing home not on 
her private pay rate, but on the mass health rate, thereby reducing this burn rate from 10,000 a month down to 5,000 a month. Uh, and the question is, can she do that, right? The answer to that is always yes. Now, to understand that, you need to understand the mass health rules. So here are the mass health rules. The house is not a countable asset as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. As I mentioned to you, there's a way around that. But in this case, for our example, the house is not countable. Mary can have other assets of up to $2,000, although we're never going to think about that number because it's so small. And once she's got that and has qualified for mass health, mass, Mary will have to pay all of her income to the nursing home all $2,000. Remember that was her income per month, Social Security, $2,000 a month, minus that amount, $72.80. That's the amount that the Commonwealth generously says that Mary can have to take care of all of her personal needs every month once she's impoverished herself, right, by qualifying for MassHealth. Um, MassHealth will then pay the nursing home the difference between the amount of income that Mary paid, the $2,000, and the MassHealth rate, which we're assuming on this bed is $7,000 a month, which, but they're going to have a lien to get that money back after she dies. And the lien's going to pile up at the rate, in this case, of $5,000 a month, because that's what Mass Health is going to be paying the nursing home. The difference between the $2,000 in income that Mary's paying and the $7,000 Mass Health rate. You with me so far? Okay. So the question is then how can Mary qualify for Mass Health? There are three ways. She can take any one of these, uh, she can buy an annuity, uh, she can lend the money to her kids. Who knew, right? Uh, or she can put all of the money in a D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. That's about the same percentage that I get pretty much every place of people who have heard of this. So we're going to talk about that for a while too. So first, she, Mary can take any amount of money, right, and buy the very same annuity that Frank could have bought and thereby convert her assets from a, from a, from an asset to an income stream, right? So Mary could buy an annuity for any amount, or use any of this cash, uh, as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is not longer than Mary's actuarial life expectancy. Mary's life expectancy at age 80 is nine years, as opposed to Frank's that is only eight, okay? So, and now, now she needs to understand that, or and you need to understand, two things about what happens if she buys that annuity. If she buys that annuity, the monthly payments that she gets, right, they're now income. And so they get added to her other income and they get paid to the nursing home, right? Um, the other thing is that MassHealth will have a lien on any remaining payments that haven't been paid to her at the time of her death so that they can get compensated for whatever it is that they have paid. So this None of what I'm telling you is a way to save all the assets. That ship already sailed for Mary because she didn't transfer things out and wait five years, right? What I'm telling you is, given Mary's situation right now, how she can reduce her burn rate so as to, re to increase the likelihood that at the end of the day, there's still going to be some money left, and also to give Mary the ability to have more than $72.80 per month to take care of herself while she's in the nursing home. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So once again, there's Mary's situation. Remember, there's the house, there's the assets, there's her, her social security amount. If Mary takes all of her cash, all 325, because she doesn't have to keep $2,000, she can have zero, right? If she takes every dollar and buys an annuity for that, and she buys it for nine years, or 108 payments, at, at the rate at which the annuity will pay her interest, which is like nothing, you know, 1%. Some, you never buy one of these things because it makes you money. You only buy them to qualify for mass health, okay? They actually call them mass health qualifying annuities when you call the companies. That's what it is, right? So, so um, she is, that, that roughly is going to yield her a monthly payment of $3,000 per month for nine years, right? For nine years. Yes, for nine years which, remember, would be added to her regular income of $2,000 a month, right? Meaning that she'd be paying the nursing home $5,000 per month, the Social Security check plus the annuity check. Remember that the mass health rate, right, was $7,000 per month. If she had sold her house and just bought a big annuity for $625,000, right, um, she will have given the combination of the $3,000 payments that she's making every month and the $2,000 per month that that lien is accumulating and that therefore is going to get recaptured at the end means that she's effectively burning away $5,000 per month. Her burn rate is $5,000 per month. And at that rate, 
all of her funds are exhausted after, oh look, 10.5 years. Remember, in the private pay system, her funds were all exhausted after five point something years, right? And at any point during that, at any point during that five year period, if Mary dies, she will have effectively saved $5,000 per month. The difference between the private pay burn rate and the mass health burn rate, right? Which is going to be left over for her kids unless she's used it in some other ways and we're going to talk about those. So you see broadly how this is kind of working? So that's, what, that's why she wants to be qualifying for mass health. She cuts that burn rate. Now, similarly, if Mary uh, were not eligible for an annuity, and she probably couldn't buy an annuity in this case if she were over 89 years old, and the reason for that is that at 89, her life expectancy has gone down to five years, to less than five years, and annuity companies, because they get these terrible returns now on these annuities, because they can't make any money either, because no one's making any money, right? Because it's all interest rates or nothing, won't write an annuity, a commercial annuity, for less than five years at this point. So a second alternative is she could lend her money to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., or to any one of them. Maybe she doesn't trust them all, right? Lend them to, or she could actually have the three of them create a trust, name one of them as the trustee for the benefit of the three of them, and say in the trust that if there's anything left over when the three of them die, it's going to get divided up, right? And then the trustee could sign a promissory note uh, back to Mary. Now, as long as that promissory note works just like the annuity, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Mary, Mary's life expectancy, then the lending of that money to the kids is not a gift to the kids. It's just a loan. And the promissory note is not an asset. It's an income stream. And it gets treated the same way. And by the way, the payment ends up being about the same. $3,000 a month, which would all get paid to the nursing home. Mass Health would have a lien on the remaining payments after Mary died. It all works exactly the same way. So why wouldn't you do this as opposed to the other? You'd always have to do this if you were over 89 years old. And by the way, this reminds me, this is the reason why when I do the general presentation about your legal documents and what you have to have, I always tell people, I say, you don't really need a will, you know? A will is gonna, and you know, if you're Frank and Mary, will does nothing for you. Because if you don't have a will, the same thing happens as if you have a will. If one of you dies, the spouse gets everything. If the two of you are dead, it goes to the kids, right? What you really need is a power of attorney. So that if something happens to you and you're incapacitated, if you're Mary here, and no one has the ability on Mary's behalf to sign her name to transfer these assets out, she's got a big problem. I have a client with this problem right now. Her husband died about a month ago. She had a stroke afterwards. She was pretty sad. And now she's incapacitated and staying in a nursing home. And they owned everything jointly. Right, of course, right? That's the plan, right? So now she has now inherited the house and $300,000 in cash. And so I would be telling her, and I have told her daughter, right, that this is what she should be doing with that money in order to qualify for mass health, except there's no power of attorney. So we have to now go to probate court, try to get, a cons get the daughter appointed as the conservator, and then try to convince the court to allow a plan whereby all these assets are being shifted. Some judges will allow that, some won't. Some judges will say, that's against public policy, I'm not going to agree to it. And if the judge won't agree to it, the conservator can't do it. And the mother's going to be on private pay. And the money's all going to evaporate. Just because she didn't have a, po a power of attorney. This is a really, really important document. Okay? So, there's the promissory note. The, now, the other, the other reason why I typically don't recommend this um, is that I'm afraid this one is going to go away. This, is a, this, this promissory notes as a way to impoverish yourself are allowed in Massachusetts still, but not in many other states. And I'm afraid this one's going to go away. But, but right now, it's still valid. And does it have to be secured at this point? Actually, no. I often suggest that, they, that my clients basically get the money, put it in trust, have the promissory note go back, have it secured by the assets in the trust so that at least it looks more commercially reasonable, you know? Because these are the kinds of cases that MassHealth is, they hate these, right? So there are these two things. And then there is the D4C pooled trust. So here we go. To learn more about D4C pooled trust, before I even start, Google pooled trust, P-O-O-L-E-D, trust, or Google any one of these five entities, which are the five qualified pooled trust administrators in Massachusetts. Um, what is a D4C pooled trust? Well, first of all, what is D4C? What is, what is that about? Um, the federal law that, that created uh, Medicaid 
is, is called 42 U.S.C. 1396, 1396. That is 42 U.S. Code 1396. And Section P of 1396, A, B, C, D, it's a big statute, right? And you get to P, and that's the section that contains all of the stuff about trusts. And it's the, the section that says that if there is a trust that was funded by the person who is trying to qualify for Medicaid, a, a so-called self-funded trust, um, then the trustee, if he, if he or she has any discretion to use any of that money for the benefit of the older person, the beneficiary, has to do it, right? So those are the ones that is so, and that's why the typical irrevocable trust, you specifically can't stay as the beneficiary because if you are and the trustee can give you money, then the trustee has to give you the money, right? There are three exceptions and they are in that section in, section, in subsection D4A, D4B, and D4C. So this is one of the three exceptions and that is if there is a trust that is administered by a nonprofit entity whose purpose is to help elderly and disabled people, then that entity has the right to create a pooled trust, a trust in which they will accept money from old people and pool it with everybody else's money and invest it and reinvest it. That's why the name pooled trust. But the money, can, the money that was given together with that interest can still be used for the benefit of the old person, right? Can still be, even though the old person, even though for mass health purposes, the assets that were given to the pooled trust don't count. And you can give all your money to the pool trust and then the next day you can qualify for mass health. So what's the catch, right? Well, one, just like with the annuity, following Mary's death, mass health will have a lien against the pool trust money, right? Um, but before I get to the other piece, I just want to kind of talk about, so why would Mary want to have money in a D4C pool trust? After all, she's in a nursing home. Give me a break. What are you going to spend money on? Well. How many of you here have ever been to a nursing home to visit somebody? Raise your hand. Ah, yes, quite a few. So to me, and maybe this isn't the same for you, the most depressing part of a nursing home is to be, and, and it's, it's really, really not, not common in the island home, but it is in a lot of nursing homes, is to, be, to go, get there and, there and you look down the corridor and there's somebody in one of those wheelchairs like, like this, right? And they're trying to sleep in this wheelchair. It's just so depressing. And now why is that happening though? That is happening because that person is sitting in the wrong wheelchair. They're sitting in a wheelchair that wasn't designed to be slept in. It was designed to move somebody from one room to another. So it has that cloth back, right? It has the aluminum arms, you know. It works fine for that. It doesn't work well for sleeping, right? And that's a $1,000 wheelchair that the nursing home owns. Now, for $10,000, you can buy a wheelchair really thick padding, it reclines, it's got a TV set, it's got a cup holder, it's got, you know, it's got headphones, you know, you can listen to whatever you want, tune into YouTube, do whatever you want, but that's $10,000, right? That's a limo of a wheelchair. Now, Mass Health, you're never going to save up at $72 and whatever it is a month to save up for that wheelchair, right? But the D4C can buy you that wheelchair. And if you're Mary, and of course, you're, you're married. You don't want to be in that nursing home, of course. But if you're going to be in the nursing home, you want it to be as good as possible, right? Because you're married. You, can't, you don't get to decide how many days you live. God decides the number of days you live. You just decide how to live them. And you want to live them as good as you can live them. And that wheelchair can really help Mary. I'm going to give you a second example. Last, no, two weeks ago now, I was at a nursing home. I spent a lot of time at nursing homes and, and visiting a client and her daughter. And the client had dementia. Nice little lady, little old lady, 85 years old. And in the next bed, there's another nice little old lady about 85 years old, except she's Spanish. And you can tell because she's watching TV. And it's all in Spanish. But of course, it's turned up high because she's deaf, you know, so that, so that, so that for my lady, who's got dementia and kind of doesn't know where she is a lot of times anyway, now she might as well be in like Spain, you know? I mean, because all she's hearing is really loud Spanish music. That's the disadvantage there are a lot of things that aren't great about a nursing home, but one of the hardest parts is the lack of privacy, you know, that you're just right next to somebody. Well, you know, what if you had a flat screen TV? And what if you had your own headphones? And what if you had any movie that you ever wanted to see? It used to be that we would, the D4C would just buy a bunch of movies. Now you just connect into Netflix, you know. You can watch, 
you know, Sound of Music a billion times, you know, you can watch Casablanca, you know, you can watch whatever you want and you're not bothering anybody, but more importantly, they're not bothering you. Now the D4C can buy that. Better food. So uh, my friend the lobster is here because about, about I want to say it's like six years ago, I've been doing this for a, a while, and so I was doing a presentation just on these D4Cs because people didn't believe it, that this actually existed. And afterwards, this lady came up to me and said, oh, Mr. Bergeron, I should have talked to you before. I often hear this. I should have talked to you earlier. Um, she said, my mother is in a nursing home, but, and, and so she's been there for a few years. We started off with a quarter of a million dollars, and now she's only got 60000 left. So this really isn't worth doing for her, is it? And I said, well, you know, in, you know, in a nursing home, $60,000 isn't very much money. You know, $12,000 a month, that's five months in the nursing home. In the real world, $60,000 is still a lot of money, right? So I said, why don't you do this, and then you'll have this extra money to spend on your mother. So she did, and we transferred the money, and we got her mother qualified. It took about a month, right? And then the D4C, they, they, they send out a social worker to talk to you, right? Or they did it in this case, and to talk to the daughter about what the mother might want. Because they tried it as part of their goal, they try to develop like a care plan for the people who have given them money to see how they can improve the lives of the person who have given them money. So they talked to my lady, and they said, so what is your mother really like? You know, once again, they gave these, well, how about a big TV, you know, with movies and stuff? Oh no, my mother's 95, she's really blind, you know, she really couldn't see. Okay, well how about music, you know? We can give her every Frank Sinatra album she ever wanted to hear, you know? Whatever she wants to hear. Oh no, she's really pretty deaf too, says the lady. So, then the woman said, well, do you have any favorite foods? The lady said, oh. She said, you know, we were growing up, we had a big family, there were like five kids, you know, and we grew up, and, and we didn't have a lot of money, but a couple times a year we would go to the shore, and we'd go to the beach, and then we'd go out for lobster. My mother loved lobster. And the lady just said, your mother can have lobster whenever she wants, right? So I talked, and so, and so I talked to the lady a couple, you know, actually two or three years later, because she was at another one of my presentations, and her mother had died, right? And I said, so did your mother ever have lobster? She said, oh, every week. She had lobster every week. So I, I go through that story, really, to, to talk about the D4C, but also to say, so a lot of times when I explain these things to people, especially for some older folks who, who get, they get very bothered by all of this, and they say, but this is just morally wrong. Aren't we just jipping the system, you know? And so I ask you, do you think it was Mary, is Mary's intention, or that lady's intention, to get Alzheimer's and go to the nursing home so she could take advantage of the system? Uh, no, right? She just pulled a, you know, an unlucky number, right? The roulette wheel got her and she had Alzheimer's, and the problem is that Medicare doesn't cover Alzheimer's. Medicare covers big things, cancer, leukemia, diabetes, anything that needs a big thing, an operation, chemo, Medicare covers it. Need someone to help you put on your clothes? We don't do that. Medicare doesn't pay that. That's not skilled enough. So the reason why people do all this stuff is because Medicare, they've never funded this, right? And that's an intentional political decision. When Lyndon Johnson, when they created Medicare, this was on the table and they took it off the table because it was going to cost too much. When Obama was trying to figure out Obamacare, this went back on the table and they took it off because it was going to cost too much and that's why we're doing all this stuff, all right? So anyway, there were a lot of things you can do with the D4C money. Finally, uh, home maintenance. Remember, in the example I gave you, Mary could take all of her cash, put it in the D4C, still have her house because the house is an exempt asset, right? There'll be a lien on the house and MassHealth recovers at that 5,000 a month, but she still has the house. But then the question is, so how does she pay the taxes on the house? Because remember, Mary's income all has to go to the nursing home, right? So the taxes, the insurance, the heat, you know, all that stuff. Well, the D4C can pay all that, right? Because it's still Mary's house. So they're still using money on Mary's behalf. So why wouldn't you do this then? Well, as I mentioned to you, there is a lien. There's also this. Um, whatever money is left in the D4C account when the person dies, uh, the D4C will be allowed to keep a percentage of that money. Now that percentage varies based on the D4C. The five of them, they all compete. So you could actually check the websites and check. It also de it varies depending on how long the person was in the nursing home. But it, for, I'm giving you the worst case that I know of. In, uh, there's one where after two years, the D4C will keep 20% of the money. So 
And then Mass Health would have a lien for the rest. We've already talked about that. So in this case, the effect of that would be if, if um, um, all of the money had gone to the D4C, the $325,000, instead of going to the annuity, right? And if Mary hadn't spent any of the money, this is the worst case, and had, and had lived for at least two years, then the D4C would keep 20% of the money, leaving only 80% available to take care of the lien and, for, and to then be distributed to the kids or whatever. So instead of having 325,000 available to do the lien, you've only got 260, right? So you can see there may be cases where that's not a good idea, right? Especially if you think Mary has a short life expectancy, right? In which case you maybe only want to put a few dollars into the D4C and put most of it into the, the annuity. So the, in most cases that I deal with, what people do is a blend of these two. And I'll just give you an example of one blend. There are infinite blends, right? Um, and in this, the example that I give, so the, the kind of the perfect annuity amount is the amount that is just enough to eliminate the lien. Uh, and you eliminate the lien, the mass health lien, by paying the nursing home every month exactly what the nursing home is entitled to at the mass health rate. Remember that's seven thousand dollars? So in this case the perfect annuity amount is five thousand a month. Because if, if you're paying the, the, the mass, if you're paying um, the, the nursing home this five thousand plus Mary's income of two thousand a month, you're paying them seven thousand a month. Which is exactly the mass health rate, which means there is no mass health lien because mass health isn't paying the nursing home any money. And the lien is for the amount of money that they pay. So just as an example, uh, if Mary took um, um, a lot of her money, right, uh, and enough money to buy that annuity to, that would pay $5,000 a month for four years, assuming the annuity is making no interest, right, then that would pay, that she would need $240,000 to buy that. I can't remember why. Um, because that's how the math works. I can't remember. So, and, and what she would have left uh, after paying that would be $85,000, right? In this case, she'd take that $85,000 and put it into the D4C. Figuring, so she made a guess. She said, probably Ma's only going to live, you know, because this is obviously not Ma that's figuring this out, right? It's Mary Jr. It's always the daughter, right, that figures all this out. So, 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 she's, so she's making a guess that $85,000 was probably plenty to buy the wheelchair and to do all of the DVD, to do everything that Ma could possibly want, and also to pay the taxes and the insurance on the house, right, for four years. And at the end of that four years, right, um, there would be no mass health lien, right? And assuming that they had used none of the money, the D4C money, right, the total penalty, so-called, so the total amount that the D4C would be keeping is only 20% of that $85,000 or $17,000. So you can see that how you try to blend the two of them. So is there a perfect blend? No. It really is going to depend on, among other things, how long you think the person in the nursing home is going to live. Right? Uh, it's, going to est it's going to depend on what her D4C needs might be. If she's well enough, for example, to travel, you might want to keep a lot of money in so you can travel with them. Right? If you've got a person in the nursing home just because of physical issues, but doesn't have serious mental issues, and you want to you know, go out and you know, go to the Cape or go to Florida or whatever, D4C will pay all of that. They'll even pay for the person, they'll pay for you to go with them. Right? Because they're not, you can't go alone. Right? So it's, it's really a matter of developing the individual plans. Um, and it's a matter of what their, their asset situation is. So take this example. Say Mary had her house worth 300000 but all she had in cash was just $75,000, right? Well, in that case, you may want to, and she's going to live for a while. You know, she's still okay. You may, she may say, well, geez, I'll take all $75,000, put it into the D4C, thereby knowing that I've got that money to buy the bed, you know, to buy the wheelchair and all that stuff. And then I'm immediately going to qualify for Mass Health because Mass Health, the house is uncountable. Mass Health is just going to put a lien on it. And then when Mary dies, Mass Health's going to want to recover that lien against the house, but all the rest of the value is still going to be there. See how this kind of works? Now, but now, and we already talked about that. So, but now I want to talk about the other example. Because um, often people will come in who have more than this in assets, right? And they'll say, well, I've got so much in assets, I should just pay the nursing home for five years, and then I know that I can keep the rest. Because everyone's heard of the five-year look-back rule, right? The five-year look-back rule. And, that's, and you're always, it's always done in a negative way. Oh, if you haven't protected your assets for five, you know, transfer them out of your name for five years, 
then the assets are still countable and have to be spent down. Well, but the flip side of that is that at the end of those five years, whatever you've transferred out is safe. It can be $10 million, it doesn't make any difference. It's all safe, right? So one strategy here would be to say, if you're Mary, what if I just transfer all the assets out of Mary's name to the kids, and then we have the kids pay the nursing home bill every month at, on the pri at the private pay rate, right, for five years. Because at the end of the five years, whatever's, and then I, the, the day after the fifth anniversary of that transfer, we apply for Mass Health, and that all works. And the question is, when is that the better system? Well, let's go back to here. Remember, that's the burn rate, right? Private pay minus income, 12,000 minus 2,000. This is in Mary's case, right? The burn rate here is $10,000 a month on savings. And over 60 months or five years, if you were using this strategy, you would have paid the nursing home $600,000. Now, in Mary's case, this wouldn't be such a great deal after five years because she'd only have $25,000 left, remember? Because all of her assets only added up to $625,000, right? But suppose she had more. Suppose her house were worth $500,000 and she had a bigger IRA or an annuity, or suppose she lived in Nantucket. So she had this house that has all this value to it, right? Um, so, so isn't it worthwhile? But remember, her income is now $2,000. So how would, how would we figure that out? How would we compare those? Well, the way to compare, because in that situation, remember, at the end of five years, she would have spent the $600,000. She had a million one twenty-five to start, so she'd still have $525,000. So is that a better deal than doing it the other way? Well, remember, comparing the two systems, if Mary's on private pay, her burn rate, the rate at which her money is evaporating, is $10,000 per month. If she's on mass health, the rate at which her money is evaporating is $5,000 a month, right? So after five years, after five years, Mary on private pay has burned away $600,000. After five years on mass health, Mary on, private pay, Mary on mass health has only burned away $5,000, right? 60 times, or excuse me, has only burned away $300,000. 60 months times $5,000. So she's saved, if she dies at the end of that fifth year, Mary has saved herself $300,000 by being on mass health as opposed to pulling all the money out, right? Exact same math if Mary has $1,125,000 in assets, right? She is saving the exact same amount, right? So the question then is, and so once again, if you're, if you're, no, I'm going to stay there. So the question is, is there a point at which these lines cross? Is there a point at which it is better to take all the money out, spend the, you know, be on private pay for five years, and then you get the rest? And the answer is fairly straightforward, right? But you got to, it, it, it's going to vary depending on income. In this case, in this case, it's easy to figure. Because remember, Mary over, um, over five years would have saved $300,000. If Mary had stayed another five years in the nursing home, she would have saved another $300,000, right? Or, or, or put another way, at her $5,000 per month burn rate, after 10 years, Mary would have burned up $600,000, right? The same amount that Mary burns up after five years on private pay except that once Mary's off the pri after those five years, there's no more nursing home bills. So that the highest the burn rate is ever, the, the highest total cost Mary's ever going to hit on, on this private pay route is $600,000. So as soon as the mass health burn rate exceeds the private pay burn rate, it, it would have been smarter to pay the nursing home for the five years. When did that occur in Mary's case? After she was in the nursing home for 10 years. Now I've been doing this for 38 years. I've known two people who have stayed in a nursing home for more than 10 years. It just doesn't happen. So in this situation, in like, in this situation, you always want to qualify for mass health. Always, always, right? Is there a situation where that's different? Well, let's take this one. Say that Mary's assets are the same as we've been talking about, the old 625, but say that her income well, obviously that wouldn't just be Social Security in this case, because Social Security, the maximum is like 2,600 or something, but say that her, she had a pension. So say her total income was $4,000 a month. And say in addition to that, she had bought a long-term care insurance policy. Long time ago, didn't pay very much money, she couldn't figure out why she was still paying the premiums, right? But 
It turns out she went to the nursing home. Now the, now the long-term care insurance policy, say it's a $200 day, a day policy. Those policies are always done in days, right? Well, 30, 30 days in a month, so that's $6,000 a month. So now, Mary's private pay, remember, is $12,000 a month, right? But now her income is $10,000 a month, right? It's her, it's her $4,000 in income income and the $6,000 in long-term care insurance, which means that her burn rate per month is only $2,000 a month, right? The private pay rate minus her income and minus the long-term care with their pay, only $2,000 a month. So at that rate, after 60 months or five years, she's only burned away $120,000. She's only burned away $120,000. Um, no, oops, I went backwards, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna go back there. So there is, in that kind of situation, it may make more sense, right, to use the private pay and then save the rest of the assets. But only in that situation, only when you've really got substantial income. A Couple of other things. Um, now th this is kind of more like odds and ends. Um, also, if, you, if Mary is living at home and one of her children is there, uh, and it has to be a child, it can't be a grandchild, it can't be a spouse, you know, obviously the spouse thing we've already talked about. But it can't be anybody but a child. So if it's anybody but a child, you've got to adopt the person, right, as a child. Um, if it's a child, and somebody's done that. I had somebody that did that. You laugh, you laugh. But. So if you're, it's a child and they've been in the home for two years caring for Mary, and if her doctor will certify and they can document that in the absence of that care, she would have needed to go to a nursing home. And that, and that the daughter is providing that care with the help with the activities of daily living. The way you, you, the way you become medically eligible for a nursing home is, uh, or for mass health in a nursing home is by showing that you, that you need a assistance daily with at least two activities of daily living, which are dressing, eating, bathing, toilet, and, and, and transferring, or that you're a, you're, you need constant supervision because otherwise you're gonna wander. That's the kind of standard dementia or Al Alzheimer's diagnosis. If, you can sh if the daughter can show that as a result of her being at home with the mother for at least two years, the mother didn't go to the nursing home, and if the mother goes from the home directly to the nursing home, she can then give the house to the daughter or the son in any, any amount, in any amount. Once again, a big deal here, right? Um, second thing is long-term care insurance. Um, not the really big kind, but the really little kind. So here's a piece of trivia for you. If you have... Is, once again, suppose you're Mary and, and you really want to make sure, you really want to make sure that no matter what, you know, in your future, you're always going to be able to give the house to your kids. Not that, well, in most places, not that they're going to keep the house, they're going to sell the house and divide up the money. In Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, the other island where I go, that's usually not the case. Everybody wants to keep the house, right? But if you really want to keep the house, if you bought a long-term care insurance policy prior to March 15th, 1999, and that policy paid at least $50 per day for 730 days or two years. And if you still had that policy in effect when you went to the nursing home and the policy still, it was still good, it had at least one day left worth of value on it. In other words, you hadn't used up all those other 729 days on home care or on other stays in the nursing home. Then you can qualify for mass health. The house isn't countable, the house isn't lienable, and there's no, there's no, um, uh, um, claim against it following your death, no matter what the value of the house. Now, of course, you're looking at this saying, but that was March 15th, 1999, right? Well, after that, same rules apply, except the policy has to pay $125 a day for at least two years, 730 days. These are small policies. The reason why I mention this is, I've, I've talked to people here, um, as well as on the other island, who have these little policies, and they're saying, why am I still paying the premium on this little dinky policy because, you know, if I go to the nursing home, I'm going to get killed, right? Well, the answer is this is probably protecting your house. And if you live here, that's your big asset. No matter what the value of the house, if you have this little dinky policy, you go to the nursing home, you can qualify for MassHealth, and MassHealth won't touch it. In Mary's case here, uh, I was actually talking to some folks that were in this kind of, had more kind of a Mary kind of asset situation with a house and some cash, and the mother well, actually, the mother was there because the mother was wanting very much to try to protect things and she was feeling really sheepish that she hadn't done anything before. Um, but they had one of these little policies. And, and I said, so what you should do 
is sell your house because the daughter lived in a bigger house. I said, sell your house, buy your daughter's house, right? For more money, right? Because if she can take all $625,000 and buy a $625,000 house, and then she goes to the nursing home, the house is safe because she has the little long-term care insurance policy, right? So it becomes a very interesting kind of planning tool once you have that. You can bury your assets in the house, right? Or just buy a huge house before you go to the nursing home. Um, and then I don't want to talk about that. That's boring. And if this was too much for you, but you want to actually see this again to kind of go over the math again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, and that's it. And you can upload and you can download it from there. Or you can watch Nantucket Cable TV. I appreciate the fact that you folks are willing to come here to do these shows. A lot of the people who really need to see this information can't be here because they're home taking care of somebody, right? So, and remember, all of these sessions are really designed to help you sleep well at night. So hopefully this has just helped you figure out something. If it's not relevant to you, it's not relevant, maybe it is. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? No, we'll, yes, ma'am, and then you. Yes, ma'am. Um, assuming that I have given my house to my children, mm -hmm. and now there is a lien, okay, that Mass Health is taking, and let's say the assets are equal to ABC, Mm -hmm. and they take the lien, and then the, the money's gone, and there's still more lien due, do they then tap into my children? I don't understand the question. You told me that, I, I think I do. I think that your, 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 your situation is, what if I give away my house, but I keep my cash, mm -hmm. right? And my house ideally is protected because I gave it away more than five years ago, right? But I've got this cash, and now I try to call. I now I need nursing home care, and so I got to spend my cash down to two thousand dollars before I can qualify for Mass Health. But then Mass Health will qualify me, and they'll put on a lien. Right. And does that have anything to do with their kids, your kids? And the answer is no. The house at that point is safe. Um, I'm going to give you one variation on that, though. The most common way in which houses get transferred is that in order to make sure that the house, for tax purposes, stays owned by the older person so that you get that step up in tax basis when that person dies. Typically, people will give their house to their children and keep a life estate in the house. That's why you do it, right? And then if you qualify for MassHealth, MassHealth will put a lien on your life estate. But when you die, and so if you sell the house, if the house gets sold while you're alive, MassHealth will be entitled to a piece of the proceeds equal to, uh, there's another chart for this, the, and, and, and the, the, the percentage of the value of the house that's attributable to the life estate. And the older you get, the smaller that percentage. But the key thing to remember is that when you die, your life estate and therefore the lien on it evaporates. So as long as the kids keep the house until you die, Mass Health's lien goes away, they get the step up in basis, it's like magic, you know, and then they've got the house. Does that answer your question? Ye yes, ma'am. My question was somewhat related to hers, but we were in the process of, of, this, of planning all of this, and we've been advised to uh, give our, our home to our children. Mm -hmm. and, but at the beginning of the talk, you said, I'm going to show you how you don't have to do that. Correct. You don't have to do you that. You don't have to, but do you still think it's a good idea? But, I mean, we're, uh, we're fairly, you know, we're just barely around 70. So, so, my, so my suggestion would be, no, it's not a good idea. You don't think it's No, a it's a good idea to the greatest extent possible to keep control over your own assets. You only do this other stuff and thereby lose control over some of your assets, right? to the extent that you have to because you feel like otherwise you're gonna get take this mass health hit if somebody needs nursing home care. But as I explained at the beginning, if one of you needed nursing home care tomorrow, right, you could simply shift all of your assets to the other spouse. The other spouse could, can own the house as long as the equity is less than 828. If it's higher than 828, you can just do a, a reverse mortgage to pull out the extra value. So you get below 828, take all the rest of the money, go buy an annuity. That annuity is going to go all to the spouse that's outside of the nursing home. It's not going to be subject to any mass health lien. So you don't need to do this. There is this, there's, there's this myth that you have to do it even if you're married and you don't. And then you make sure that your husband, but you tell your husband though, change your will, right? You've got to make sure that your husband's will says that if he dies, whatever he owns is going to go in trust for your benefit. And you're going to name one of your kids as the trustees. As long as he does that, and as long as you make sure that the assets are in his name before you die, he dies, the day he dies, everything is safe for you, right? And if your kids, if you want some of the assets back, assuming that the kids like you, right, they can give the, any amount back to you, 
And that's okay, except if you then need to qualify for mass health, the amount they gave back to you is going to have to get spent down because it was yours. But everything else is safe. Everything else is safe. So you don't have to do this. You don't have to lose control of your house unless he just drops dead. So you, you, know, you want to you you know, get this part you know, kind of straightened out. But as I, I'll tell, mention one other thing, people will tell, say, well, what if one of us just drops dead and they don't have all the assets in their name? And I'll say, yeah, that's possible. So if there's one of you, between the two of you, who has like a history of heart attack, you know, that you might drop dead, you may want to stack the assets in that person's name to begin with, knowing that if it turns out that the other person gets sick, you can always just shift it to the other person, right? But the second thing I'll mention is, remember when we were growing up, people used to drop dead a lot? Remember, you know, you just hear somebody would just drop dead, you know? Well, how did they drop dead? Well, they dropped dead because they had a heart attack or a stroke and they dropped dead. That doesn't happen. I mean, very seldom, right? They always find you. The ambulance shows up, there's EMTs, there's this and that, they get you to the hospital. You're gonna, you're gonna die, you may die soon, but you're not gonna drop dead, which means when my clients do all this planning and they say, so when which should, we, should we call you? I say, if somebody gets sick, <laughs> right? If you need, because you don't have to move the assets around ahead of time. You can wait till the last minute. Literally, you can move the assets the day before somebody dies. We just did that, I just did that. Right? You move the assets to the person who was dying, and because the will says everything is in trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse, the moment that person died, everything was safe for the benefit of the surviving spouse. So that, that's my, that's my, that, that's kind of a long answer, but it's a very important, it's a very important thing. Now, okay, I'm gonna do one more variation on this though. Two stories from Martha's Vineyard, two stories from the other island. One, lady called me up from Vineyard Haven, uh, just wanted to talk to me for a second. I had, hadn't, she had seen, because I do these present, some presentations there too. Um, and she said, well, Mr. Bergeron, you know, so a number of years ago, I, tra I only have one child, right? My son, so I transferred the house to my son and I kept a life estate, right? And it's more than five years, I know the house is safe, but my son just got served with divorce papers by his wife, is there a problem? Boy. I said, oh yeah, there's a problem. Because your son owns the remainder interest in your house and you're 85 years old, which means your son owns over 80% of your house. And that's gonna be in play in the divorce, right? That's the reason why sometimes you don't wanna transfer directly to the kids. That's why a lot of times people will transfer it to a trust. I'll give you a second example. Um, folks in Oak Bluffs, wonderful couple, Afro-American couple moved from Roxbury to, you know, they had a summer place in Oak Bluffs for years and they ended up moving there. They had done well, they had a business. Um, but a number of years ago, they transferred the interest to their, ki their four kids. And they kept a life estate in the house because they wanted to save the house. So now they're in their mid-80s. They're still in great shape, but they don't want to live in Oak Bluffs anymore. They want to move back to Boston, right? All their families there and stuff. So, but their, their asset is their house. Their big asset is the house, right? It's a beautiful house, right? So I said, so they said, so they asked their kids because the kid, they needed to have the kids give back the remainder interest so they could then sell the house. And three of them will. They said, but what about the one who won't? I said, is there anything we can do? I said, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. You can't shoot him, because then his remainder interest goes to his kids. It doesn't go back to the parents. You can't even shoot him, right? So there are, there are those kinds of, st so better to keep control of your assets. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Here in Nantucket, um, the house we live in was willed to me. Um, it's on the tax rolls and everything. I am the owner of the house. Mm -hmm. Is Massachusetts a community property state in the way that Texas was? The question is, is Massachusetts a community property state? No. No. No, and so, and the, and, the, and the rules that would apply regarding the transfer of property and, and would be the rules that apply in the state in which the property is located. So none of those rules would have applied in Massachusetts. Okay, any other questions? Now, yes ma'am. These rules, if you, if you give up your Massachusetts residence and move to, everybody does Florida, does that change all these rules? If, if you move to another state, does this change the rules? Yes. Yes, the day that you move to Florida, well, and so by the way, that's, that's the reason why when you're thinking about this, you wanna be thinking about not so much where you might move to, but if you were frail, where would you be in a nursing home? So it may be that if you're moving to Florida, but your kids are still up here, and so you're saying to yourself, if I got frail, I was just the person I was just talking to, that the mother's been in the, 
Florida for many years, but now she's getting frail. If she is, goes to a nursing home, she's going to the island home because her daughter is here, right? Which means you want to design everything with Massachusetts in mind. If you have kids in several states, you want to make sure that there's a lawyer from each state that sees the documents so that you can figure out. I got somebody in Martha's Vineyard who's got three, they got, they're still ma you know, married, both alive, but the wife's very frail. Wife's got cancer, her husband's got a lot of uh, physical disabilities. And the three kids are in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. So we had to do a plan. He might stay he in, in Martha's Vineyard or in this area, right? But he might also go back home, but home might be any one of those three states. And the day he walks into that other state, he becomes a resident of that state and that state's rules apply, right? So you wanna think out where you might end up and make sure your plan works in that state. Or if there are many states, make sure it works in all the states. In general, the Massachusetts rules are the, are the most lenient rules in the country. Massachusetts and California. Are the most lenient? The most lenient, oh, by far. Oh, by far. By far. Florida's murder, Florida is murder. Hey, we're talking a very red state. Florida is murder, right? Massachusetts, even among the New England states, is just terrific. In Connecticut, Connecticut, if the, the, everything I said about the two spouses and you transfer to the house and you can't do that in Connecticut. Connecticut, if I recall correctly, the other spouse in the home actually has to sell the home within like six months or a year if one spouse goes to the nursing home. How bad is that, right? But in that situation, I had this particular, I learned that because the, situ, the situation was they had kids in Massachusetts, right? So the, the husband, went, we brought him to a nursing home outside of Worcester. And that day, the rules in Massachusetts came to apply, and so we saved the house. Well, how can you right? say you're suddenly a resident of Massachusetts and you just give up everything even though you It's a miracle. Your house is there. You just do. You're the day that you move into the day that you move into a state saying that it's your intention to stay there, that day you become a, Mass a resident of that state. Okay. It's not like the rules, it, it, dis despite the fact that for income tax purposes, for that particular year, there might have been some kind of other rule. I'm just saying for mass health purposes. I need to finish because I gotta get to that 3.30 boat, so I'm gonna ask one more time. Oh no, you t there was somebody, late, somebody that told me they would drive me. Who told me they would drive me? Thank you. I don't have to worry about this. I just have to make the 3.30 and hope the waves, the surf isn't up. Um, I'll do that last question and then I'm done. Yes, ma'am. And that is correct. Yes, and that is Thank correct. You. That is correct. Okay. For that reason, by the way, the only, the only hard part about Massachusetts, they still can't get over it. They still say that once you've done that, right, you can no longer, you can't call the Connecticut home your former home because you're not going, because in order to make the house exempt, you have to say you intend to return to it. And if you intend to return to it, then you haven't become a Massachusetts resident. Oh, but we've fought that case and won at the, at the administrative level, but it keeps coming up. Thank you very much for coming. If I don't see you, have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you next year. All right? Thank you. 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 Thank you.